So welcome everybody to um, our lunch session on transparency in supply chains. Uh, my name is Helen Carter. I work for um, Action Sustainability um, and the Supply Chain Sustainability School in the construction industry. Um, basically, we're really, really pleased to see you here and pleased to welcome you to this event. And I'm even more pleased to um, introduce you in a short moment to some amazing speakers, all of which I have worked with in varieties of forms over my career. Um, who are very wise and very knowledgeable when it comes to how you deal with transparency in supply chains, particularly in relation to human rights. Um, the format of the session is very informal. Um, you'll see a slide um, that I'm going to run through with you in a moment. But fundamentally, um, we have got uh, a welcome. Um, we'll do some introductions um, and a panel discussion. Um, and we're encouraging you to do Q&A. So please make sure that you can um, put any of your questions um, in the uh, chat box. I've seen a couple of you saying you can't hear anything. Has anybody, can everybody hear now? Can I have some thumbs up if anyone can hear or a thumbs down if I'm still causing an issue? Can people hear? Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, the session is really informal. We are not going to be deaf by PowerPoint. We are literally going to hear from our amazing speakers um, very shortly. Um, and as I said, I'm going to encourage you to um, include any questions in the chat box that we may have for our panellists. If you'd like to speak to anyone in particular, please put their name in. Alternatively, if you have a general question, I'll ask it to the panel. Um, but the key here is just to get a big discussion in thinking about what transparency means and, and why it's so important now for our businesses. Um, OK, so from the perspective of before we go into introducing individuals, it's important to understand why this is such a hot topic um, and why individuals are talking about this more and more. Um, we are in the five year anniversary of the Modern Slavery Act. It's been in place since 2015 um, and it is and was seen as a legislation um, that is designed to really make businesses accountable for our exploitation in their supply chains, really starting to get to grips with do we know what's going on in our supply chain and can we address this? Um, five years on, um, you can talk to some people who think it's been a good success. You can talk to some people who think it's been a complete disaster. There's a huge spectrum of opinion in terms of how the act um, has, has been received. And in fact, that, that opinion um, has led to the government um, start to thinking about changes in the legislation, which is announced on the 22nd of September but putting greater emphasis on businesses now to really get their act together, not only around their statement, but around how transparency is addressed within our supply chains. So it's important to make sure that we understand that transparency isn't a fad, it's not going away. And actually, although it's talked a lot about within um, the realms of human rights and, and exploitation and trafficking and the, the sorts of challenges you'll be aware of probably during this week, due to um, anti-slavery week. Um, it's not an old, it's not a new concept. Um, and I would put two words in front of transparency um, around COVID and around Brexit and around the fact that you are all probably addressing transparency within some shape or form around a number of issues that your supply chain is, is trying to deal with. Where are your goods and materials going to come from during COVID? Could you get um, the right materials and products to keep your businesses afloat? So uh, transparency as a concept is not a new one. Um, and what we're going to hear from in a moment are some brilliant speakers who are going to give you some insight into some of the issues that are hidden in your supply chain in pertinent relation to human rights um, and exploitation. Some of the challenges of a big business and how they've been able to do this. Um, some of the challenges in relation to um, in relation to um, SMEs and how they've been able to address this and public sector. So a huge variety of opinions on how transparency has been looked at in relation to things like the Modern Slavery Act. I'm going to introduce you to our speakers very quickly and then I'm going to shut up and pass you to, um, to Neil. Um, but we have Neil Wilkins, um, who's head of migrant workers program um, in the Institute for Human Rights and Business, who's done a lot of work um, out in foreign um, construction sectors, particularly um, on the issues around recruitment fees. So he'll be giving you a really good insight into that. 
Um, we're going to hear from um, Alex Troutrim, who is at the University of Nottingham, and I have to get that the right way around because I always get it wrong. Um, and he's going to talk particularly around the sort of public sector um, and the sort of business models and why transparency is such a challenge. Um, we can hear from Alex Hans from um, Sir Robert McAlpine talking about the big business challenges that we have. Um, Keila Jardine will be able to give you the perspective from an SME um, and again from the University of Nottingham. And last but definitely not least um, is Helen Alder from SIPS um, talking about what's particularly um, precious to me as a procurement professional in terms of how do procurement um, deal with transparency. So I'm going to hand over um, and I'm going to do a bit of a whiz pokery on the AVU and I'm going to hand over to Neil now who's going to introduce himself and give you a bit of an overview into his perspective on the challenges of transparency and, and the human rights issues in supply chain. So over to yourself Neil. Thank you very much Helen and I hope that everyone can um, hear me well. Um, so my name is Neil Wilkins, I'm Head of Migrant Workers Programme at the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Institute, um, we're a civil society organisation, we operate um, internationally and um, we try to persuade uh, business to use a human rights lens to view the activities um, that they're undertaking and um, uh, to do that we generally use as our framework the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. Um, I'm a migrant workers specialist, so I'm interested in migrant workers in all supply chains and um, in all locations. And uh, as we all know, many migrant workers um, uh, face all sorts of um, challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, not, not least, they're at the forefront of many companies' efforts um, to prevent uh, modern slavery. Um, as Helen has pointed out, it's five years since the um, uh, institution of the Modern Slavery Act was was made, and um, we all have different opinions on its um, on its effectiveness. I think that one of the things with the Act is that um, when it first came out, in particular, um, it caused a flurry of people to go around looking for slaves. Um, you know, it's about modern slavery, and therefore there must be slaves all over the place that we need to uh, usually sort of save. Um, I think that once everyone had calmed down a bit, we all started to realise that actually what needs to happen is we need to look at the processes um, that allow slavery um, to manifest itself, the processes within company operations that might allow um, situations of forced labour and trafficking um, to happen. For migrant workers in particular, uh, chief among these would possibly be the fact that many migrant workers in many supply chains globally um, will be um, paying large recruitment fees um, to secure employment abroad. Um, it's well documented and many of you will be familiar with this, but many migrant workers will be paying several thousand dollars to um, Oh, I'm sorry, can, can people hear me? I'm, there are some messages coming up saying that people can't hear. Um, can, yes, no, we, I think we can hear you. Emily's trying to deal with them. So if you, uh, okay, if you no, yeah. um, uh, many migrant workers will be paying um, large sums of money to secure employment aboard, several thousand dollars on a job that perhaps would only earn you um, two, three thousand dollars if you were lucky. Um, in your first year and of course workers take out large loans to be able to afford this and are then saddled with recruitment debt um, and end up in situations of debt bondage because very often what then follows is that the job doesn't pay the amounts that um, people were promised and the fantastic contracts, the amounts of overtime, um, the amounts of pay, all the bonuses, all of these things um, sort of dematerialize once workers um, get abroad and they find themselves trapped in these situations of um, debt bondage, which is an indicator um, of forced labor. So a lot of the work that we do is around preventing, uh, trying to prevent workers paying recruitment fees and we work with companies to try to make sure that they are working with their suppliers to make sure that the suppliers or the brand company are paying recruitment fees. Um, the 
handy little slogan that we've come up with to describe this is um, the employer pays principle. There is a cost to recruitment, somebody needs to be paying it, but it's important to make sure that you know who that person is. So we call it the employer pays principle, which states no worker should pay for a job. The cost of recruitment should be borne not by the worker, um, but by the employer. And we have a group of companies in our leadership group for responsible, responsible recruitment who are working to, first of all, make sure that that goes on within their own supply chains, but also advocate with many others to see if we can make that a global prohibition on recruitment fees, um, ultimately. I'll stop there, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Niona. That's, that's been really interesting. So from a, from a, an international perspective, it's always really useful to understand what's going on around particularly the recruitment fees. I know in the UK, it's not something that we see an awful lot of, um, although more in that sort of criminality. But Neil's work is, is, is really, really interesting in terms of that international context. And from a construction perspective, um, and, and being a massive football fan, we could talk to Neil quite interestingly later on about Qatar and, and, and what's been going on and the creation of the World Cup um, stadiums and, and those elements. So Neil, keep, keep, get your thinking hat on because I'm going to ask you some questions about that later. Okay, so thank you for that. We'll go into a Q&A session a little bit, bit later on, but, but I'm going to introduce you now to Alex Stratum, who I've, I've had the pleasure of working with for about five or six years now. Um, and he's going to look particularly at the public sector and at the business models and generally talk about the work that's been going on in supply chains um, and some of the challenges. So I'm going to hand over to yourself now, Alex. Thank you, Helen. Um, yeah, well, as you also already introduced me, um, uh, I skipped that part. Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm based at the University of Nottingham uh, Rights Lab. Um, I'm looking after the Business and Economies program, but I have a, a personal interest largely in supply chains, procurement and sourcing. And so, yeah, a few years ago, we started working uh, together on uh, procurement in the construction sector. And for the last few years, we've been advocating, probably all of us uh, in, in, in this room, um, we've been advocating very heavily for the inclusion of the public sector. Um, and I think that was a, a big gap in the Modern Slavery Act, um, particularly in the sectors where the, where the public um, sector is, is, is a dominant buyer you know, in infrastructure and so on. Um, so we now have that. Um, the public sector is, uh, is being included in the Modern Slavery Act. And I think that will probably be over the, over the next year or next years um, a, a, a major area of work. Um, how do we make that work effectively and meaningfully? Um, so public procurement, as most of you will know, is working fundamentally differently to private procurement. Uh, there's much less capability around a continued supplier management, a continued supplier development. So a lot of the tools, I think, that we've seen in the private sector being used to fight modern slavery in the supply chain, um, those tools actually not existent or, or not as developed in, in public sector procurement. And so how we how we develop that uh, in, in a time when uh, there won't be much resource for the public sector available, I think that will be um, really, really quite an interesting space to look at. Um, I think there's also probably a concern about you know, what, what are the kind of questions that public authorities will be asking and how do we make sure they ask, well, again, meaningful questions, but also asking similar questions so that not every tendering process, not every um, supply chain mapping exercise is going to start from square one, but that we actually have, you know, more standardization, more harmonization um, across uh, local authorities and public sector buyers um, as, as we go ahead. Um, I think most of most of the companies that uh, have started looking into their supply chains, yeah, you will have found out that they're actually uh, much much messier than uh, they they would hope for. Um, and I think you know we've all seen this with COVID. Um, you know the absolute panic buying that's been going on, particularly by governments around uh, PPE. Uh, medical provisions, sudden disruptions of supply chains, you know, has really highlighted um, how little many organizations know about their supply chains, how little relationship they have with absolute key suppliers. Um, and so I think mapping a supply chain is actually much, much harder 
uh, than people think. It's not just a whiteboard and a you know few people standing around with uh, with, with pens. No, it, it it is actually difficult, um, and there's a lot lot more hidden uh, things than 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 we would hope for. So I think there's there's a lot more work coming our way over the next years, um, and we need to think you know how, how we solve solve these challenges. Yeah. Are you are you able, Alex, at this point to to talk about the work that's going on in BSI um, with with? Yeah, Trump yeah, sure. Um, and and I, I know there's actually quite a few committee members in in this call, so uh, I uh, I've been bullied into uh, chairing the committee for developing a uh, a BSI standard um, on organizational responses against modern slavery. Um, with yeah, some absolutely great contributors uh, from across industry, academia, uh, civil society, um, and really with the hope to um, have a well, a vulnerability-informed standard um, that works across industries, um, and that you know will, will give us a tool, hopefully, that can be mandated into supply chains um, to set a bit of a best practice standard and what expectations are. Um, because I think we've learned a lot over the last few years in terms of, you know, what works. Uh, there's still a lot more learning to be done, but I think we have some good foundations. Um, and it's the more we can roll them out in a harmonized way, um, the, the more they will be accepted um, and the easier it will be for everyone uh, in private and public sector um, to actually, you know, work against modern slavery. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. We'll get onto that in a moment. Henry, I've noticed your question. I will answer that shortly um, at the end of that one because I can give you some insight. Um, OK, I'm going to now hand over to Alice, um, who works with Sir Robert McAlpine, um, who's working tirelessly um, in her organisation to try and work out how the heck you do this um, and how you do create transparent supply chain. So, Alice, I'm going to hand over to you. Hi, everyone. And uh, Henry, thanks for the, the lovely warm welcome. Um, yeah, I'm Alice Hand, head of Business and ethical procurement for Sir Robert McAlpine, the sort of tier one main contractor in the construction industry. So, um, when the Modern Slavery Act came out in 2015, um, at SRM, we sort of very quickly decided that we didn't simply want to um, comply, but we wanted to absolutely respond to it. And I would hope if you look over our past sort of four statements, that you can see progress um, is evident in how we are sort of enacting that ethos of improvement year on year. Um, since 2015 and our work on this, we've been very much focusing and addressing um, the risk that exists in our supply chain in regards to the workforces that are on our that are on our sites. And I think the feeling was to an extent, and I think it still exists now, that there's a huge amount of education needed and learning needed within the industry to at least first recognise that it was a high-risk industry in regards to the prevalence of labour exploitation and therefore we needed to address it. Um, a key focus uh, for us and how we've been working is how we engage in our supply chain on this matter. Um, we're currently working with a third party in, on an audit programme that consists of sort of mainly two strands at the moment. One where we look at our supply chain partners and their processes and procedures and one where we actually go onto site, talk to the workforce, and they take part in an engagement survey. Both work well together and they've enabled us to really delve down into our supply chain in a way that I don't think we've done before and understand that labour. Um, is, can anyone can everyone hear me? Yeah, if you just yell up a little bit, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> and, and understand, uh, is that better? And then, yeah, and understand our supply chain in a way that perhaps we haven't done before. Um, I would say kind of one of the challenges that we have is really getting, and it's some, only some, but some of our supply chain to understand that while they may not directly be employing the people that are on our site, they are still morally responsible for their welfare beyond what they may think of the traditional health and safety remit. Yeah. Um, while the audit program is something that we've pursued ourselves, we've also been working in conjunction with um, industry initiatives such as the Gangmaster use of um, uh, that GLA construction protocol and I think that's really important and I think one of the challenges that we have as an industry is that while we all have our own projects and our supply chain relationships ultimately our supply chains are connected they're similar they overlap and therefore the challenges the challenges that we need to work across those boundaries to ensure a collective success I think 
for the industry. And so if you look at transparency itself, I believe it's really important that we need to establish a, a sort of common ground of what good looks like. And I think, as Alex mentioned, when you start delving into the labor and recruitment world and, and your supply chains and you start mapping them, it's really complex. Um, it's quite murky. Um, and carrying out the audits, we've seen a huge variation of how people are onboarded and recruited. Um, but you need to establish a consensus because I think otherwise there's a risk that businesses can choose simply not to talk about a particular issue if they don't want to. Um, and I think if you take outside the construction industry, if you look at uh, Boohoo and in fashion, I think for a number of years there have been stories and, and articles about what was going on there. Yet, if you look at some of the ESG ratings, they're rated really well, I think in the top 29% of their peers. But they chose not to disclose anything on traceability of materials and labour exactly where the issues are so when you're talking about transparency i think you need to be clear about what you're assessing and measuring and what that good looks like and i think as an industry a challenge for us is determining what that good looks like um, and taking it forward making sure we're all on a level playing field um, so if you talk to our supply chain partners that's something that they will regularly come back to us with like well we're not on a level playing field with all of our peers um, so it's whether you're manufacturing a t-shirt or constructing a building, you should be judged on that level playing field, and which includes sort of areas of sustainability in terms of transparency, um, so we can have that understanding of what good looks like. So I think that's the challenge going forward for us. Brilliant. Thank you, Alice. That's great. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate the, the microphone's a bit challenging, but I think, I, I think we got there. Which is really good. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand over now to um, Akila um, from the Rights Lab, um, who's going to talk about the work she's been doing with SMEs and obviously the work that the Rights Lab does. So, Akila. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Akila Jardine, and um, as Alan mentioned, I'm a researcher in the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham. Um, my area of work focuses around understanding the continuum of exploitative labour and employment practices and how abuses could escalate to modern slavery um, in high risk areas of the labour market. Um, and separately, I also focus on understanding tactics to engage small businesses in the anti slavery agenda. Um, so, today, I just want to talk a little bit more about you know, SMEs and anti slavery efforts. Um, and also some of the research that we've been conducting um, at the Rights Lab. So one thing I want to highlight is that, you know, now more than ever, um, COVID-19 has really demonstrated that there needs, you know, we need to have all hands on deck really um, when it comes to building resilient supply chains and protecting human rights. And the need really to include businesses of all shapes and sizes. And so, you know, as many of you know, with the modern slavery legislation, um, businesses with an annual turnover of over 36 million or more um, have a legal responsibility to um, obligation to report on the steps that they're taking to tackle modern slavery within their supply chains um, and operations. Now, the Home Office estimates that 17,000 businesses fall within this threshold. Um, these, however, only account for a small percentage of UK businesses. Um, the government notes that smaller businesses, you know, may voluntarily produce a statement um, and expects larger businesses to exert pressures um, through their contractual relationships. However, research has shown that many businesses are still failing to comply with even the basic requirements of the legislation. Um, so, for instance, um, our colleagues have done some research in the agriculture sector and they found that, you know, many firms that fall within the scope of legislation um, and not identifying the high risk areas within the organization. And they're not mentioning the effectiveness of um, their KPIs, for instance. Um, and so one of the questions that we have is that as companies with benefits of a greater turnover in sense of legislation, uh, showing little effort to mitigate modern safety risks, it raises the question how useful the legislation is in engaging smaller businesses without the same resources or incentives. And, you know, as we know, smaller businesses play an important role in most economies. Um, in the UK, it's estimated that 
of the business population SMEs. And so that's really around 6 million businesses with the majority falling into that small business category. So when you look at, you know, 17,000 businesses versus 6 million, there's really a lot more work that needs to be done to engage um, SMEs um, as really they're in a unique and critical position to help contribute to anti-slavery efforts, particularly in the UK labour market. Um, but however, one of the issues is that while there are numerous tools and frameworks and incentives and justifications aimed at engaging businesses on this issue, you know, such as anti-slavery legislation or such as different industry initiatives, these tend to focus um, on the largest players. They tend to be devised at national level um, and they're often sometimes inaccessible to smaller businesses who may have limited resources and who typically adopt a survival strategy of prioritizing growth and you know, economic responsibilities. And so supply chain traceability and transparency, it's often seen as something that's expensive, complex and time consuming um, for smaller businesses. And it's sometimes been seen as a burden. And I just want to talk going through a little bit with our own research that we've done. So with our research, what we wanted to do is further understand how smaller businesses can be mobilized to contribute towards anti-slavery efforts. So this involved examining first 86 professionals' knowledge um, and attitudes toward modern slavery um, to highlight some of the limitations of current anti-slavery tactics and identify strategies that can be implemented to promote the engagement of small organizations. Um, and we found that with participants in our studies, again, there was a range of SMEs, um, there was a general lack still of understanding of modern slavery. Um, and participants seemed to give more consideration to related labor market issues, such as engaging with employees or paying workers national minimum or living wage. Um, and so while some lack understanding of the more extreme forms of abuse, such as modern slavery, their emphasis on good labor and employment practices is really critical um, for securing decent work and for also tackling exploitation across the spectrum. So this includes exploitation ranging from lower level forms of labor abuse um, to more extreme forms amounting to um, modern slavery. Um, an interesting finding is that most of the SMEs in our sample, they felt really connected to the issue of modern slavery when discussing cases within the community. Um, and this is in line with previous research that's been done around social responsibility, uh, which has shown that you know, smaller companies tend to experience a more personal relationship with the local community. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that we, we were quite keen to further explore is how communities can be used to engage SMEs um, you know, as employers, purchasers, but also neighbors as well. Um, our research also emphasized the importance of owner managers and smaller businesses who are closely connected with the direct operations and activities of their firm. So unlike larger businesses, some SME owner managers um, are less likely to face some of the bureaucratic challenges when wanting to adopt um, new behavior practices to address modern slavery. And so anti-slavery mechanisms really um, must recognize the influence of owner managers as individual decision makers who need to be moved through a process of awareness building towards practical and achievable action. And so um, just to wrap up, because I'm noticed I've gone on for probably over six minutes now. Um, but um, like large operations, you know, small businesses have also felt the impacts of COVID-19. You know, as other speakers have mentioned, it's disrupted supply chains, it's reduced the supply of labor um, and the demand for certain goods and services. Um, some businesses have been forced to close. And so again, it's, you know, COVID-19 has, it's heightened the vulnerabilities of modern slavery. It's demonstrated the needs for more resilient supply chains that are able to respond and recover quickly to disruptions um, without sacrificing human rights um, and the need to bring all sizes and shapes of businesses to the table to effectively combat exploitation. Um, so on that, I will just end now. Brilliant. Thanks, Akila. I'll come back to you um, shortly once we've heard from Helen uh, later on and some of the other guys are, uh, around that really interesting dynamic of um, SME's roles in that transparent supply chain and whether they're ready to understand their role and whether they know how to respond to it. 
Um, because I think that is one of the challenges with the larger organisations particularly. Um, but we're going to hand over now to Helen, um, Helen from SIPS, who's going to talk about the work that SIPS have been doing um, in the space of upskilling, if you like, um, procurement professionals within this area to understand what transparency means. So without further ado, Helen, I'll hand to you. Helen, thank you for the intro and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm not sure I'm the super duper expert that Helen makes me out, but anyway, I do know a little bit about this area and have been championing it since about 2009 in the wider sustainability sense. And just to say a little bit about SIPS, uh, just in case you don't know who we are, we are the largest global institute that represents procurement and supply chain people and we are a chartered body, we are a charity and uh, we're there to do the public good as well as to retain our members and ha we have procurement qualifications that uh, have an element of sustainability in them embedded throughout. We also have an option in it and of course that does touch on slavery and human rights. Um, specifically since 2011 I think um, Supply Management, our magazine, did some really big campaigns on slavery. Um, and I think people at the time thought we were a bit bonkers because not many people were talking about it at that time. Um, but we did an awful lot to raise the awareness. And um, in 2015, when the Slavery Act came in, we actually ran some um, guidance campaigns around that as well and a mini poll that we did at the time showed that 92% of our uh, community and members actually learnt about the Slavery Act coming in through SIP so that's really positive. Um, so what SIPS is doing in this, in this space specifically, so we talk about it in a generic sense in everything we do sustainability we include human rights and that social kind of element but uh, more specifically um, we do run um, a in fact we've we've got quite a unique program in this space um, and it is called the SIPS modern modern day slavery and supply chain program um, we have um, as part of that a one or two day workshop and we also have a gap analysis risk assessment tool that looks at policies, processes and procedures. And that creates a gap analysis tool where organisations need to specifically look at and tighten up. And that could be a policy, it could be training, it could be uh, something along those lines. But the programme is quite unique in that it's pick and mix and it kind of tailors to the um, what the organisation really needs. Um, so we also, and it looks, it's kind of, we also have a capability programme specifically in construction, which came out of um, Grenfell. And that's not really about slavery, but it does highlight on some of the, the skills that procurement people need that manages that, as, that human rights aspect and relationship uh, management um, process around all of that. Um, also, we have the Ethics e-learning test and that's absolutely fabulous piece of e-learning if anybody's ever gone through it. It's quite comprehensive, but, uh, you know, without actually destroying somebody, it, it kind of takes half a day to go, go through and gives them um, a really good, good introduction into the subject the first time you go through it. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of leaves you with lots of other areas and resources to investigate after the e-learning programme. Um, after the e-learning is done, you have to pass, you have to get quite a high pass mark. Um, and we do ask you to pass that now to become a chartered member. Um, so that's quite important for us. We are literally at the point of relaunching that. Um, and the new programme's really good. It looks a bit different. It's a bit more engaging and a bit more structured um, and takes you through all the things that you really need to focus on um, with regards to environmental and human rights slavery and that social aspect of sustainability as well. 
We do actually have um, a corporate ethics mark as well. So that's not just for members. Um, anybody can buy into that. It's very good value. And you can actually gain a corporate ethics mark for your organisation that you can use on your website, etc. Um, and then I guess the only other thing that I should say is as a member, and this is kind of my area that I look after more specifically, we have an awful lot of guidance um, and we have huge amounts of tools, templates um, and things that, you, that can help you do your job when it comes to things like risk assessments, identification. Um, and I think we've already heard that um, supply chain map mapping is really difficult and people say you should map out your entire supply chain. Well, that's so hard to do and I know some big organisations have only kind of you know dented the, the, some of their supply chain and it's cost them millions of pounds to actually try and map that out to date um, so it's not an easy thing I think that's been identified um, so there's lots of things we've got you know guidance on um, audits collaboration sharing stuff tools uh, pre-qualification, how to do that and include some of the questions required um, and I can talk about that a bit more later. So thank you Helen, try to speed up a bit but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry. Um, okay, so, so you've heard from our speakers who've, who've provided some different contexts um, around the challenges that, that, that they do have. Um, what you are going to also see, um, hopefully, from the, from what they've been speaking about, is, is some of the challenges around transparency being not just modern slavery, and I'm looking at your question, um, but also some of the other areas um, to consider as well. So we've talked about COVID, we've talked about Brexit, um, potentially being other issues. Transparency is traditionally linked to uh, modern slavery mainly because of the Transparency Act, because of the elements within the Act that talk about transparency in supply chains. But actually, if you're starting to look into your supply chain around human rights, which you have that legal obligation to do, um, then you can quite easily start to overlay other considerations. And in fact, the work I've done with a colleague, sorry, the work my colleague has done, um, James in, in Action Sustainability, that showed quite, quite nicely that if you start to get into a transparent supply chain, you can start to overlay other challenges you have associated, not just slavery, um, but obviously issues like water shortages and climate change. Um, before I ask a question of Neil, um, Henry, I'm going to just answer your question around ISO 2400 um, in the BSI standard. Um, it is explicitly linked in um, from a procurement perspective, um, deliberately because it is the standard that talks about sustainable procurement and human rights um, and labour standards are part of that sustainability lens. Um, so we we are making sure that that is very, very closely tied in um, and, and follows that good, good procurement practice. So hopefully that helps. Um, I'm going to ask a question of Neil now, um, in particularly in relation to um, changes he's seen internationally, um, with obviously the creation of the Act being very much people thinking about the UK, um, but actually has he seen any impact in his international scope of work, um, either of our Act within the UK um, or improvements in transparency within supply chains, as in seeing supply chains starting to get connected. Um, so Neil, have you seen any of that? I, I think the um, the UK Modern Slavery Act has um, worked for um, British companies uh, and others who fall under the aegis of the Act um, it, uh, abroad in, in that they, they have something to show their suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I am asking you to do this. I cannot trade unless I am I'm being seen to do this. Um, and I think that that works up to a point, but there is a point up, up to it works. Um, the other quick thing to mention around that is that the words modern slavery do not play very well in all parts of the world. In Southeast Asia, it, it absolutely um, doesn't um, command, uh, well, people don't like you to use that expression. They, they don't see that as being what um what what is going on and um, very often many of the processes um for instance the recruitment fee issue that we would like to see changed and altered and we refer to that 
with a modern slavery lens, but they would see that as being normal practice. That that yeah. isn't slavery, and so there's sometimes a confusion of terms, and um, it starts to make something look like uh, to them um, it, it doesn't always appear to be like that. The the other things that we would say do seem to have had a bit more of an effect actually are things like the U recent U.S. Tariff Act, um, the um, TIP report um, really does seem to exercise governments um, in some of the countries um, where there might be issues. Um, uh, getting a poor report in the TIP Act certainly does seem to exercise the minds of governments um, in the region. And uh, a really good example actually is the impact of the EU yellow card on Thai fishing. Um, that really did uh, focus um, a lot of attention onto the industry and we've seen enough changes to see the rescinding of the yellow card. Um, many of us would still like to see a lot more changes within that industry. But it's this prohibition on trading, it's, it's the stick that perhaps comes with some of the legislation that perhaps has been um, more uh, useful and more constructive. Just one last question, and then I'm going to ask um, Alex a question. The collaboration piece, obviously, when you go abroad is really, really important where, um, you know, you, you do not have leverage in the international waters, but need to deal with the supply chain. Have you seen any really good examples of that or any bad examples of that? Um, I'd like to think that our own leadership group for responsible <laughs> recruitment, of course, is a good example of that because it's it is a collaboration of um, 15 now uh, multinational brands all committed to the employer pays principle. I think significantly within that um, we also have members, firstly, um, several civil society organisations, um, including importantly Migrant Forum in Asia, who are a migrant uh, support group. They're an umbrella organisation of about 50 other groups and their inclusion in our work has been very um, significant. I, um, we, it, we've got good relations between their component members and many of our members now and it's um a, been a very useful sort of feedback loop to make sure that the work we're doing actually does relate to the people that we're trying to um, help and so often that gets forgotten the other significant um collaboration within the leadership group and in many other uh, ways is with the ILO and the IOM um, as businesses uh, many of our businesses, they don't, we don't have the technical knowledge or expertise or the language skills to understand employment law in Myanmar, in Thailand and um, places like this. But nearly always there is an ILO or an IOM office in the region that does. And so we can use what we do is use the leverage, the collective leverage of companies to support those efforts. So the ILO will be talking to the government of, 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 of a particular country and we can marshal uh, a company voice behind what they are trying to achieve. And in that way, we end up with a political engagement that would be very difficult for a, a company acting on their own. And to be honest, no company really on their own is going to be there standing on a rock, shaking their fist at government. It, it, it's just not going to happen. But collectively and through the ILO and the IOM processes, potentially it can do. And I think that's a really important point when we're talking about transparency and we're talking to trying to address whether it happens to be human rights or whether it happens to be climate change or something along those lines. Actually, once you start to get into that understanding where your supply chain is, understanding the initiatives that are underway in those areas that you can could stand behind or join to then make that collective movement. Um, and, 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 and we in turn work with many others. We work with the Responsible Business Alliance, with the Consumer Goods Forum. Um, many Very often we'll have members in common as well, but exactly so you can get all of these organisations lined up behind initiatives. Yeah, which is important, it's important. Alex, you had the enviable task of trying to talk about public procurement and, and obviously the impact of the changes on, on, on what that's going to look like. Um, where do you think um, the biggest challenge is going to be for public sector in terms of trying to instill transparency um, in its supply chain? Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I think the biggest challenge is actually um, the capability side. Um, I think, yeah, I think when we look back at how um, 
supply chain transparency models lab was implemented in the private sector we, we found a lot of processes that were already in place that we could piggyback on and we just you know edit um, and improve those processes and i think there is you know, a lot of the things we were talking about were supplier developments, you know, educating the supply chain. Um, and I think in public procurement, it's it's just much more um, a, a tendering process um, that and that is that is actually law. Right. So it's it's um, it's it, it's much more about being process compliant in the tendering. Um, and it's not so much about a longer term engagement with suppliers and educating them. Um, there's not the the opportunity in public procurement actually to incentivize suppliers to do the right thing with the promise of future contracts mm. or future you know ongoing relationships. Um, you know, in public procurement, people would be terrified of that, right? Um, and 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 rightly so, right? So there's much more about the fairness of the process and uh, and the bidding process. Um, so I think how do we get around these things and i think it's probably okay to say this you know, when you when you think the first the first few meetings uh, when we spoke about modern slavery and construction people were terrified about what this means from a competition law perspective yeah. are we allowed to talk about our suppliers right um you know the same by the same buyers in the same room talking about the same suppliers right and and we had we had legal counsel in those meetings for uh quite a long time and until we kind of were comfortable to talk about suppliers um, as long as we don't name them as individual suppliers um, but that that took a lot of getting used to um, and I think uh, the public sector will have to similar obstacles but probably even even more strongly yeah. um, and I think Mark makes a really good point actually then in the chat right I mean mm -hmm. there there's competing interests. Um, there's this always economic sustainability that will top the others. Um, I, I would think, I think the quality argument aligns, right? I think uh, modern slavery is, is hidden. So, you know, you want to know who is supplying to you. You want to know who does the work. Uh, I think really fascinating piece in construction is that modern slavery prevalence go, really goes down in the skills in the, in the skilled trades, right? Mm -hmm. you, you want to know who fixes your gas boiler, right? Mm -hmm. That's important, right? Um, and so very often the quality argument actually aligns with, you know, the transparency agenda um, and so on. I think that's that's just something that is really important to bring together. Um, yeah. I think the thing as well, Alex, to, to add to that point and to Mark's point as well around around um, the, the procurement process and how you achieve that mapping and transparency. The, the challenge that we had when we did the mapping exercise, um, and James will explain it to you, no doubt, um, was actually getting the supply chain to tell you who they were using. Um, and that actually provides um, us within our sort of role as procurement challenges in how we gain trust amongst our supply chain around how we actually um, allay fears that we're not about trying to um, best the supplier and go to their suppliers to cut costs. But this is a genuine approach to improvements in. And you can take out human rights, you can put quality, you can put resilience, you can put anything in there. So it is a real different way of thinking of managing. Um, and it's about managing supply chains, not about managing suppliers, um, which again is a different, different thinking. Um, thanks for that, Alex. I know we've had long conversations about public sector and things they need to do, but yeah, I think the supply chain management, that sort of development will be a real challenge for them um, in how they're going to be able to do that. Um, Alice, hopefully your mic microphone is going to hold out, but I'm going to ask you a quick question um, in terms of, oh, you've got to have the microphone on. Um, <laughs> Um, what would you say is your biggest challenge um, in yeah. terms of embedding the processes and the way that you operated in Sir Robert McAlpine? Is, is that any better, Helen? Yes, it's perfect. OK, thank you. Um, in terms of our challenges, um, I think it's about linked to transparency. It's, it's relatively easy to talk to our tier ones, the people that we directly subcontract with. But getting actively getting into our supply chain and down past that tier two is a challenge. And I think it links to slightly what Alex said. Sometimes there's a resistance, a commercial resistance not to give us that visibility because they think there's a it's commercially sensitive. 
information, you know, what would we do with that? So, and that's why I think in terms of perhaps looking at what's worked well for us is when we've really worked with our supply chain. So even we have this audit program, but we we don't just send this third or audit um, third party in. We go with them. Um, so it's not just us pointing the finger at our supply chain, but we go with, with the third party um, and sit in those um, discussions. And it's, uh, and it's about understanding where we are as an industry. And again, I think of maybe the projects we've been more successful with. It's when we've had clients that have really worked with us from the start and collaborate with us um, on projects from the start. And we each take responsibility for the issue. And whether you're talking about transparency, modern slavery, quality, you can't just pinpoint it at one point in that supply chain. And that's what we Alexi. do in construction. We, we allocate Alexi, those. Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry, Helen. Ah, My back? Yeah. yeah. Um, whether it's transparency, quality, you know, it's about allocating risks in our projects in a supply chain. That risk often gets you know pushed down the supply chain. But actually, we've got to reassess that risk, distribute it more evenly. So we all look at it and, and assess it. Um, and I think, you know, looking at Mark's question around, he asked about, I picked up in my comment about that level playing field. To an extent, yes, you'll get that working with like-minded contractors or companies and peers. You can, you can work to raise the bar. But I do believe, ultimately, you've got to have regulation or legislation to help produce that that level playing field um, you, we've seen it in with the GLAA in agriculture and fisheries yeah. do we look at the construction sector next yeah no definitely that's an interesting point thanks Alice and I think also to Mark's point um, around um, ar around the issues of um, how, how supply chains can work more collaboratively within that mm -hmm. space um i think it happens more than you think it does um actually um and what we've just never done in, in in i know in construction but actually if you go outside construction um i'm married to somebody who works in manufacturing it's a normal way of life for the way that procurement works and supply chain does so don't discount what we already have in place um the other thing with the mapping um which is to helen's point and obviously something that mark picked up as well is to think about your prioritization so initially when the act first came out everyone went oh, i have to map my supply chain now i don't know about anybody else but you've probably got twenty thousand suppliers um uh, you know the 80 20 rule um, will apply um and we do know as alex has alluded that some trades have higher risk than others so the mapping comes after you have done your risk assessment it doesn't come first and that was a big mistake that I think we found a lot of businesses were trying with the transparency was ah, how do we do this because we can't map 20,000 suppliers well you're not supposed to mm. um, and that's what we've like by just getting you learn so much by doing something so we with our audit program we started just looking at 12 that led us very quickly to actually certain packages we should we should look at and by getting in and actually doing something you start to learn more and more and then you can map further yeah, I think, um, and I'm going to ask Akilah a question in a moment with the SME perspective, but I think what's also happened quite well is, is the fact that there is now a patience out there. So if organisations can demonstrate that they're doing something other than tick boxing, then they are almost mm -hmm. given a free pass to a certain extent. If they seem to be tick boxing, then actually they're under more scrutiny. So it's in your interest to be better at the due diligence and actually do it and take longer to do it and be honest about it that's mm -hmm. i think this is a given more respect for that than, than necessarily you know like you say the boohoo or, or, or some of the others that just tick a few boxes and hope they get away with it um akila I, I i know from your perspective you were talking about obviously the pressures from the sme and the fact that they they are um they're looking particularly at being closer to the community um what advice or what what key things do you think smes need to at least try and address it um and get support for it if that makes sense so in terms of um aiming for like transparency really i think business leaders would need to first be clear um about um what is it why is it that they want to be transparent um so whether it's to improve their relationships with their supply chains or the reputation or whether they're concerned about um labor exploitation so look at what look at what it is that they're really trying to achieve 
Um, I would also advise that small businesses to look at what other businesses are doing to be transparent, uh, particularly through modern slavery statements. Um, and I think here really collaboration is extremely key. Um, so whether it's collaboration with NGOs um, or experts in your particular sector um, or with expert stakeholders that can share information with you and help you to understand um, where the risks lie within your specific organization um, and sector. Um, and then moving on to, so Helen mentioned, you know, the importance, um, important actually assessing your risks and then being able to map your supply chains as well. So then it's probably starting with, you know, your direct suppliers um, as, a, as a first step towards mapping your supply chain operations once you identify where these risks could lie. And I think, you know, it's really important to also set um, KPIs for yourself and be able to actually um, assess your performance regularly. You know, one of the, a lot of the reviews around modern slavery statements reporting is that organizations aren't reporting and how they're effectively um, measuring the steps that they're taking to um, address modern slavery risks in the organization. So I think it's really important to be able to measure your performance. And then again, decide, you know, what information you really want to sh share publicly and to who, um, and also how often you're going to share that information as well. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, many SMEs don't fall within the, the threshold of the modern slavery legislation. So really it's up to you to decide, you know, how you are going to share that information um, in what formats and, and how regularly you're going to do that. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I think as well, making sure SMEs understand what their role is in mapping is important. Mm -hmm. Um, that at no point should anybody be going to their SMEs and asking them to map their supply chain, but they should be allowing them to connect the dots. So at least asking where are you getting those things from? Um, because I think there is a nervousness that when you get down into tiers twos and threes, suddenly they're supposed to know absolutely everything. But actually just asking questions and starting that is a good place, a good place to go, um, which, which helps within that space. Um, I have one last question and then I'm going to have a look at the um, the questions and answers in the in the in the chat box um, and this is sort of for Helen I suppose and from a procurement professional perspective I'm a bit curious myself um, but but what would you say um, what's the hearing you're getting from procurement professionals in terms of what support they need to really start to drive transparency um, are you seeing any sort of training needs or are you seeing any sort of requests for more information more detailed information would you say uh it's curious, I think, because um, people kind of want to know a starting point. They want to know tools are available, templates, where the free resources are, what the guidance is. Um, I would say, if I'm honest, an awful lot of organisations are a little bit worried about having internal people in to delve into their processes. Um, and I, I just think that's a kind of reputational thing. They, ju it just concerns them a little bit. So I think um, having having the right information, the starting point, the right tools available, um, and knowing where they can go for certain things. So you know, like training, generic training might be great. Po help with policies might be great, mm -hmm. but. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced that organisations are wanting that huge, great, big end-to-end -end thing at the moment where yeah. somebody comes in and looks at all of it in one go, if you know what I mean. I, yeah. I think it's yeah. like a bit, a bit chunky at the moment. Um, I agree. And, and that's why I think I, we are. So I, I would say, I mean, we've talked about a lot of this already, the risk, the risk identification and the supply chain mapping, there's an awful lot of tools and templates out there that can help. And there's free resources, <coughs> that, you know, start with something that looks at geographical, geographical and commodity and category risks and overlay those two things to give, it, give an idea of where your high risk categories might be if you have no idea. Yeah. And then focus on those suppliers or those supply chains, I should say go back right back to you know as far as you can possibly get and try and get some uh, worker engagement right at the end of the supply chain if you can with yeah. worker surveys worker committee feedback um you know audits are amazingly expensive so there's other things that that could help such as worker committees and having a hotline and grievance mechanism and 
making sure that the workers know about that. And then there's, um, I guess, all the collaborative stuff that's been talked about as well. Share industries sharing knowledge and sharing maybe audit data, or it could be, uh, you know, something else. And that collaborative element, those partnerships with NGOs, or whatever it is, are amazingly helpful. I think that's a good starting point. And I and I don't think it needs to be quite as scary as it might might seem. <laughs> Definitely not, definitely not. No, thanks that for Helen. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think there is a lot out there. It's worth looking around this week. You will see a, a number of organisations all talking about what it is that they can do to support. Um, but I think the key message for this is, is you know, collaborate um, and have a look. So I think we've managed to answer most of the questions in the chat box I've seen. Um, and thank you, Neil, for your big long response to Emily about the, the, the the supplier management side of things. Um, thank you so much to my panelists for their insights. Um, an hour is never long enough to talk about something that is this interesting and complex, but hopefully we've given you some little ideas of what to look for. Um, please, as Emily's, um, as AS point out, please fill out the feedback form if you can. Um, but in the meantime, um, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and I hope you enjoyed the session. So thank you so much um, and goodbye everybody. Thank you.